Welcome to the Wade Center's podcast. A podcast of Wheaton College. Lewis said part of the reason he loved McDonald's, he said he knew of no other author who so continuously aligned with the spirit of Christ. So often he was hearing elaborations and amplifications on Christ's teaching. Mm -hmm. When McDonald briefly preached in Manchester, uh, one of the parishioners said, when I first saw him take the pulpit, here's this big burly man with a long beard, and I just didn't know what to expect. But as soon as he started speaking, I felt like I was listening to the voice of Jesus. Wow. Mm. And you know what a wonderful tribute to someone. Uh, his son, uh, Ronald McDonald, oddly named, <laughs> said, As much as I admire my father's books, I admire the way he conducted his life even more. Mm. Wow. Welcome to the Wade Center podcast. We're focusing our conversation today in our basement on George McDonald, who is often referred to as the father of fantasy. And as we were thinking of how to present McDonald, we recognized how diverse his writings are, and it struck me as being like a house that has many different doors, and different people enter into George MacDonald's thought through different doors. And you could say the very first floor of the house is just acquainting yourself with his literature, the second floor of the house is the scholarship about McDonald. And then finally, I would say that the Garrett Attic. And he loves Garrett Attic rooms in his fiction. That's where people start writing their own scholarship on McDonald. Mm. But we're going to talk about that first floor and the different doors that people enter into conversation about McDonald. And I think most people who listen to a Wade Center podcast are going to enter through C.S. Lewis. David, why don't you talk about that? Well, first, I'm a little concerned about the house metaphor, because in McDonald, the basement is where you have goblins and caves that lead into the lower reaches of the earth. And we're doing this podcast in the basement of our house, so I hope that's not a bad precedent to talk about McDonald's. The house doesn't have to be haunted, David. Oh, okay, okay. Well, actually, uh, Chesterton said that reading MacDonald made him think about reality differently to realize an ordinary house could have this queen-like grandmother in the, in the attic and have goblins in the basement and gave him a magical view of reality he hadn't thought about before. Most people know MacDonald, I think, b because C.S. Lewis wrote a famous essay in the introduction to his anthology of MacDonald. And it's really amazing. He says that every single book he wrote was influenced by MacDonald, and he may have quoted MacDonald. He also said when he read Fantasties as a teenager, he just picked it up by accident in a bookstall at a train station, that he crossed a great frontier, that here was fantasy that was infused with spiritual values. And he said he discovered a sense that death could be good death. And surprised by joy, he says when he read other fantasy stories, when he closed the book, there was a feeling of letdown because he had left that wonderful world and come back to reality. Mm. But he said when he read Fantasties, uh, the bright shadow of reality came out of the book and it made the real world seem more enchanted. And I think that was the spiritual values that are embedded in his fantasies that so impressed Lewis. So, but I would warn our listeners to not always see MacDonald through the lens of Lewis because Lewis loved the fantasies and he loved the spiritual values in the fantasies. But there's a lot to be said for some of the Scottish novels and the English novels. Some of the other things I think are really worth reading and those aren't the ones that Lewis talked about as much. Well, that's why I talked about um, various doors mm. that you could enter through the fantasy. And some people love it, like C.S. Lewis. But I've had several times when individuals have come to the Wade Center and I've shown them. And this is one of my favorite things in our museum is we have an old manuscript, a handwritten manuscript yeah. by George MacDonald, where you see he wrote one of his novels and he's crossing out words yeah. uh, under glass. And I say, look at this old manuscript. It's almost 150 years old. And people said, oh, I, I was never able to get into MacDonald. But mm. that's because they only tried to go through the door that C.S. Lewis went through, mm. the the. Um, fantasy. In fact, let me read something that Dorothy Sayers said in the, her <laughs> in the two thousand plus pages of the published letters by Dorothy Sayers. She mentions McDonald only once. Oh wow! And here 
is what she says. She's responding to Barbara Reynolds. And that was something about him having a farm, wasn't it? (sighs) I'll choose to ignore that. (laughs) Barbara Reynolds was uh, in collaboration with Dorothy Sayers. They were both Italian scholars. Sayers was translating Dante's Divine Comedy for Penguin Books. And in 1957, so this is just a month, before Sayers died, Barbara asked her if she ever thought of one of the characters from MacDonald as being similar to Virgil, who leads Hmm. Dante through Hmm. hell and purgatory. And here is how Sayers responds to Reynolds. As a matter of fact, I didn't read At the Back of the North Wind until after I had written the thing about Statius. Statius is a character who stays with Dante into the earthly paradise. Mm. Everybody's heard of Virgil, but Statius is the guide that can get him closer to paradise. The George MacDonald books aren't too easy to come by nowadays, except the Curdy reprints. And I didn't really exert myself about them till after reading Lewis's Surprised by Joy. Mm. For I hadn't been brought up on them and wanted to see what it was that had moved Lewis so much. I found Fantasti's rather tiresomely German romantic. Mm. And I liked North Wind much better. I think a lot of people I run into feel the same way as Sayers, that German romantic element of his fantasy. And uh, Aaron, why don't you, in several sentences, just remind us what she would mean by German romanticism there? Uh, Yeah, so, uh, well, there's a lot about German romanticism. But in short, uh, Lewis actually connects the dots with Novalis in his preface to Lewis's, uh, his anthology. Um, And he just basically mentions uh, in the preface that there's this story, now there's debate about whether or not all of the events of this are true, but that he spent some time in a house in Scotland cataloging the contents of the library and that it was there that he came across um, the works of some of these German romantic authors and he gets uh, he into... He McDonald. Yeah, he McDonald gets into Novalis and these other authors and so uh, Lewis describes sometimes his writing as sometimes an oversweetness picked up by Novalis. And so there's a fascination with nature and a connection with nature Uh, And this feeling that God can give you things and you can have these experiences through nature and they're sort of mediated. Um, And there's a lot more uh, that that it goes there. He gets accused of having bad theology from German Romanticism as well when he's a pastor. Um, And if you want to learn more about Romanticism, we discuss that more in depth in another podcast. But that's definitely something that you can sense in McDonald if you're aware of sort of German Romanticism. If you come at it, not knowing that, I think sometimes you just read it as, um, you may interpret it some someplace else, but that's definitely a door that I think some people come in through McDonald is through right. romanticism. Right, they just, they love the fantasy and others are not attracted to it. Yeah. Yeah, when he, he was only a pastor for a few years before he lost his job, and one of the accusations was too much Germanism. Yeah. Uh, which, Germany is a fascinating culture because when people hear the word Germanism, they would probably think of Prussian efficiency. And, you know, mechanical expertise. Uh, But actually, this whole strain of romanticism is very otherworldly and mystical, a love Mm -hmm. of imagination, a love of the irrational and the dreamlike. And both Lewis and MacDonald were influenced by novelist or Friedrich von Hardenberg. Mm -hmm. Hardenberg, isn't it? Well, that was the name of the novel. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing that Lewis was really impressed by in MacDonald, which you can find in some of these other writers, is what he called mythopoesis. He said that MacDonald wasn't a great prose stylist, uh, but that he had this ability to create myths in a way that very few authors can do. Uh, Traditionally, mythology is not created by one person. It evolves in a culture, many many, uh, voices over many generations. But Lewis said some people like Kafka and MacDonald can tell a story in which the narrative pattern is so powerful it somehow relates to the fundamental patterns of the cosmos and of our lives, even apart from the words which are used. For me, the example is Arthurian literature. I love the whole idea of King Arthur and the round table and the, the, the military battles and the search for the grail, but there's no one author who captured it all excellently. Mm-hmm. You kind of, 
you get the idea of King Arthur as this great chivalric experiment, but you read Mallory and you read Tennyson and they just don't capture the, the feeling of the myth of King Arthur. Yeah. That's interesting because one of the people who claims that MacDonald influenced him was T.H. White, who right, wrote that's right. Once and Future King about mm. the Arthurian legend. Although Lewis didn't like uh, Once and Future King because it has a lot of humorous anachronisms like people checking their watches and other <laughs> things like that. Lewis said, this is the product of a sad, shabby little mind. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> I know. Oh. Well, you'd hate to see that in a review, wouldn't yeah. you? <laughs> yeah. Lewis also, I'd hate to see that on a student paper. You get your oh. paper back. This is the product of Yikes. a sad, shabby little mind. Uh, Lewis actually says in the preface, he says, Most myths were made in prehistoric times, and I suppose not consciously made by individuals at all, but every now and then there occurs in the modern world a genius, a Kafka or Novalis, who can make such a story. MacDonald is the greatest genius of this kind whom I know. Yeah. Right. Another interesting tidbit that he includes in that introduction mm -hmm. when he talks about how Fantastes baptized his imagination is he compares McDonald's writing to silent cinema, which is mm. kind of like mm. this putting together of images. It's yeah. not the language that you focus on. It's the creativity of the image itself. So I find it quite fascinating that, and I've never heard anybody talk about this before, that McDonald's grandson became a Hollywood screenwriter. He oh, actually really? moved to Hollywood in 1931 and wrote screenplays for Charlie Chan movies, if you've heard of those. Oh. And actually adapted a story by Agatha Christie for the screen and wrote the the scenario upon which Alfred Hitchcock based his adaptation of um, Rebecca. Oh. So he had quite a good reputation in Hollywood. This is McDonald's grandson. Huh, that's well, fascinating. his son was a novelist and another son was a famous surgeon. George McDonald was fascinating because he was such a lively imagination, novels, poetry, memoir, sermons. But he also was very interested in the natural sciences. He wanted mm -hmm. to go to med school. And even after he became an established writer, he would still teach courses in chemistry and physics and natural science at a prep school in Bedford. So it's interesting that one of his sons followed through on the natural science thread, Greville, and became a surgeon. Huh. But another son became a, a, a novelist in his own right. He actually got a master's degree in chemistry and physics. And that is very unusual for someone huh. to right. ultimately get their reputation as yeah. a writer. Um, I, as an English professor teaching English majors, we would just all together, when any time the idea of mathematics came up, every single English major would just groan. You know, it's just, it tends to mm. um, have a, just a different intellectual attraction. So for McDonald to both uh, be a chemist and into physics, but also fascinated by poetry, by the novel, by realistic novel, fantasy, mm. he was a brilliant man. Well, he, and he, besides knowing the natural sciences, he spoke Greek and Hebrew and all the modern languages. He read mm -hmm. Italian, German, French. Uh, people don't realize what a powerful mind he had apart from his imagination. People mm -hmm. associate him as a fantasy writer, but he was an amazing individual just in terms of his intellectual capacity in general. Yeah. Maybe we should call this uh, episode Surprised by George. Ooh. The things you didn't good, know about that's George. That's a good title. I like oh. that. Yeah. Can I ask you a question, David, before we move on? We keep talking about uh, Lewis's imagination being baptized by, by McDonald. And he mentions in that preface to the anthology on McDonald that it's like a death. And you quoted that. How is that? What does he mean when he says that his imagination being baptized is like a death? Obviously, with baptism, there's the death and burial and resurrection metaphor. What does Lewis mean there? Well, at the end of Fantastes, Anodos, whose name means one who's lost his way, one without a path, he gets killed by a wolf and he dies in the fantasy world. He's entered into the fantasy world and is a kind of death of self, but then he wakes up back in the real world. It's a little bit like Dorothy waking up in Kansas. Mm -hmm. and But now Kansas has been transformed and he was gone for 21 days, which is exactly his 21 years of life uh, up to that point. So I think there was a sense that you don't need to fear death because it's really the death of the self 
but the psyche survives beyond death. Uh, both Lewis and MacDonald lost their mother as children, and they both had this tremendous feeling of uh, bereavement, but also abandonment. Mm. And I think there was something about um, that death isn't the end of everything, mm. uh, that you could actually go through this transformative experience that is really the death of the self, but it's not the death of the soul or the psyche. Oh. It's, a, it's a mysterious statement, but I think it ties into that idea that in the spiritual world, death is not dangerous. There's more to the entire universe yeah. than what we think of. Well, and that is a theme you see in McDonald a lot is that sort of transformation um, right. of things being transformed from one thing to another, or things like that. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. You mentioned the Wizard of Oz and Dorothy's experience. In a way, Dorothy's imagination had been baptized. Mm -hmm. And why it stands out to me is that Frank Baum, who wrote The Wizard of Oz, claims that George MacDonald influenced him. Oh, wow. And H.G. Wells really liked Lilith, one of uh, MacDonald's most difficult books for most people. Uh, We mentioned Chesterton. Madeline Lingle called him the father of fantasy. We know what C.S. Lewis thought. Yes, he has an amazing influence. Mark Twain. Mark Twain. His daughters loved At the Back of the North Wind, and he always had a soft spot for MacDonald because his daughters loved that book so much. Huh. And Lewis Carroll. Scholars claim that Lewis Carroll would not have written Alice in Wonderland if it weren't for MacDonald because really? he MacDonald's children had been reading this manuscript that... Uh, Dodgson, his real name, had been putting together. And it was MacDonald who said, you need to publish this. And so Lewis Carroll published his Alice in Wonderland books the same decade that MacDonald was publishing his more realistic. Oh, wow. I wonder if anybody's tracked down the uh, Through the Looking Glass came out after Fantasties. And there's a very important Cosmo episode. There's a, He goes to a library and MacDonald, people often go to these great libraries based yeah. on the experience you mentioned. Mm-hmm. And in some ways it is a symbol of the, the sum of human knowledge, all the yeah. wonderful things you can discover in a library. Yeah. So Anadose picks up a, a book, which has a story of a fellow named Cosmo, mm-hmm. which I'm sorry to say always reminds me of Kramer in the Seinfeld, <laughs> but he buys a mirror. And then in the mirror image, this beautiful woman comes into the room, but yeah. he can't see her in real life. And then in Lilith, it's really important a mirror. He goes through the mirror. And I've always wondered if the Looking Glass episode or the, the, the sequel to Alice in Wonderland was somehow influenced by McDonald's. Huh. He was that makes, of his, go ahead. I was going to say that makes me think there's, there's a whole episode in The Matrix. Um, this may seem totally unrelated, but it really is, where uh, Neo touches the mirror and it kind of comes on him and all of a sudden that kind of breaks his reality, oh, right, right. right? And now all of a sudden he's sort of out of the um, dream world and he's into the real world. Um and that they they reference the through the looking glass and Alice in Wonderland is the inspiration for that. And so you could, you know, perhaps George McDonald's influencing the Matrix. So it's just interesting to see this idea um, sort of flowering and going through different mediums. Yeah, well, it's very Jungian. The Jungian critics really like McDonald. Oh, really? I even wonder if Lion Witch in the Wardrobe, he mentions there's a looking glass in the door of the wardrobe. Mm. And that whole idea that it's a portal to an alternate reality, I think that may have come from. It is a very Jungian image, the whole idea there's an alternate universe, which could be the spiritual realm apart mm-hmm. from our physical realm. It could be the world of imagination yeah. apart from our everyday world. There's a lot of ways to interpret going through the mirror. Yeah, definitely. So, Crystal, you mentioned a bunch of authors who are no longer with us um, that happened to date back to a sp- specific time. Um, how did you get into George MacDonald? What is your door into him? Well, my interest arises from the fact that for 20 years before David and I accepted the job at the Wade Center, I taught Victorian literature Mm. at a Christian college. And what fascinates me is the, the comment I read several minutes ago from Dorothy Sayers saying, well, his books are hard to get now. And I ran into a quotation from another person influenced by MacDonald, Oswald Chambers, both wow. David and I, our mothers loved um, his my utmost, my for, utmost his for his yep. highest. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and Chambers said it is a striking indication of the trend and shallowness of the modern reading public that George MacDonald books have been so neglected. Ooh, and I have to confirm that as 
a student of Victorian literature is I taught for 20 years, which meant I was keeping up on scholarship. I published a dozen articles on Victorian authors, and never once did I ever run into the name George MacDonald in any of the scholarship anthologies of Victorian literature that I was using don't mention MacDonald. And so I thought, well, that may have to do with the fact that the Victorian era was known for its, quote unquote, faith crisis. Mm -hmm. And they were grappling with the development of um, evolutionary theory. So I went to some books on Victorian religion, more recent scholars who are trying to show, no, there was still a thriving Christian mm-hmm. culture mm-hmm. in 19th century England. Yeah. Wheaton College's own Tim Larson wrote a fantastic book, Crisis of Doubt, Honest Faith in 19th Century England. Yeah, excellent book. One is called Victorian Religion, Faith and Life in Britain by Julie Melnick. McDonald's name appears nowhere in her index. Wow. And it's like he has been effaced from the history of Victorian literature. And that huh. really fascinates me as a student of Victorian literature. Why do you think that is, though, Crystal? Because he has, he takes on some of those things head on and like Lilith. I mean, Lilith is, you know, sort of this guy that's been inculcated in evolution and science and all these things, and he's sort of an anti-spiritualist. And then the whole thing is him sort of coming to the, it's sort of reconciling that, that swing in Victorian religion. I think some of it could be that he started out as a poet, and he's just not that good of a poet, frankly. So I was thinking about the difference between one of the most profound poems written in the Victorian period, Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach, which reads... The sea of faith was once too at the full and round earth's shore, lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. What a powerful description wow. of wondering where one's faith is when everything you've been taught as you were growing up, mm. that you have to assume a certain interpretation of Scripture. And it wasn't just science, although the word dinosaur is a Victorian coinage. Yeah. The word scientist was first used by Victorians to describe people who are analyzing empirical data. Huh. The word agnostic is a Victorian word. Oh, wow. So there really was a struggle with these things. And then coming out of Germany again was mm. the higher criticism, yeah. which was taking apart the Bible mm-hmm. and questioning, oh, this is just one vast mythology. Yeah. And one of the great Victorian authors actually st- translated from the German Strauss's Life of Jesus, which is a demythologizing of Jesus. Okay, so George MacDonald went through his own faith crisis. He dropped out of college his second year, and that's what at least one of the biographers that David and I have read, Michael Phillips, says that they think this is the year when he went up to that library Mm -hmm. and was working in a library. So here is how... He talks about his faith crisis, and you could just see it does not have that evocative um, power of language that you get in Arnold's Dover Beach. He says, I search my heart, I search and find no faith. Hidden he may be in its many folds. I see him not revealed in all the world. Duty's firm shape thins to a misty wraith. No good seems likely. To and fro I am hurled. I have to stay. Only obedience holds. I haste, I rise. I do the thing he saith. And if people were judging George MacDonald by his poetry, much the same as if people were to judge C.S. Lewis about his poetry, Lewis was not a good poet. Dorothy Sayers wrote her first two published works were books of poetry. She is not a good poet. But they then moved into the writing of fiction and 
mm-hmm. captured people's imagination that way. So also McDonald did. But that's then what baffles me because I just finished reading one of his Scottish novels, Alec Forbes of Howglin. Mm-hmm. It is fantastic. MacDonald puts his poetic sensibilities into beautiful prose. Mm. In fact, I was reading the Wade copy. I just wanted to have a pen and just underline, oh, this is so beautiful. This is beautiful. This is profound. And of course, I couldn't. Uh, and <laughs> so you. I want to no, read it You're supposed again. to have a pen. You're supposed to have a pencil when you're <laughs> yeah, reading that's Wade copy. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well, I was reading last night a biographer who felt that uh, in Lilith, there's a beautiful scene where he's standing on a rocky shore listening to the ocean water come in and it's very gray and dreary. And he thinks that's influenced by Dover Beach. And it's actually a much more powerful prose paragraph. I don't have it here in front of me than what you just read oh, from the poetry. Exactly. Hmm. His prose is fantastic. Well, so that sends us back to why was he overlooked? But here's another reason. Okay. He includes the Scottish dialect in his novels oh. because he was he was born in Scotland. He loves the Scots. It is hard to get through. Uh, hard is an understatement. Right. Yes. It's almost like a foreign language. <laughs> yeah. It is. You can't even make it out. Oh, yeah. So you, you have you to feel- start saying it out loud in right. this like really caricature-ish kind of way just to even kind of get an idea of what he's trying to say, which does not make for... I was trying to read a McDonald novel one time in an airport, and I got to one of those sections, and I was like, I, I give up. I like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I Michael Phillips is actually... They're all in public domain now. He's going back and simplifying the dialect so it's easier for the reader to well, understand what they're saying. it's already been done by oh, a wow. guy named David Jack. Yeah, David Jack is doing that too. Oh. So I have a copy, since I loved Alec Forbes of Haugland, and the reason I chose Alec Forbes of Haugland to start with is after reading the biography by Michael Phillips, who is the most famous McDonald scholar, I was fascinated by his comment that um, Alec Forbes and Robert Falconer are the most autobiographical and that he uses elements of his childhood most thoroughly in those two novels. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll look at those first. This is kind of an example of um, uh, MacDonald, the the myth maker. There's a scene in one of those. He had a very severe Calvinist grandmother, MacDonald did. And at one point, she burned his uncle's fiddle because she thought it was a d- diversion from his spiritual growth. She wanted people to read nothing but the Bible and Pilgrim's Progress. And a lot of uh, McDonald's spiritual pilgrimage was escaping from this stern Calvinism of his, uh, of his youth. His father was a wonderful father, but from his schoolmaster and from his uh, grandmother, he received this great emphasis upon predestination as opposed to free will. He had a, I wanted to read a quick sentence of his about the Westminster Confession. Yeah. They would actually teach these little students, um, you know, catechism question by question. Uh-huh. And this one poor little girl, they ask what happens to those who are not saved. And it's supposed to be, they go to eternal damnation. Uh-huh. But the guy's actually hitting her. The schoolmaster's hitting her with a thong and he can see, you can see the welts coming up on the backs of her legs. Oh. And he says, what happens to those who are not saved? And she says, uh, they get a licking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but this incident with burning of the fiddle, there's a very evocative uh, passage in Robert Falconer where he and his brother have a beautiful kite they take down to the beach and it's shaped like a dragon. Uh-huh. And they discover there's enough breeze in that part of Scotland. They take the kite all the way home. They hand the string into the bedroom window and then they tie the string around the knob of the bedpost. So all night he can feel, I'm in this humble little cottage, but I can see the string going out the window, which leads to this beautiful kite fluttering in the wind in the moonlight. And it's a great image of how the human is tied to the transcendent. Huh. Mm. But then when the grandmother smashes the fiddle and burns it, he just quietly goes upstairs and unties the string of the kite and lets it go. Oh. And it's hard to say what that means, but it's a very evocative episode. Mm, yeah. So I think that's even the uh, non-fantasy novels, they have these mythopoic moments. Yeah. They really make you stop mm, and think. Mm. Yeah. In Alec Forbes, he has these wonderful lines about the severe Scotch Calvinism. And he actually says that in his training going up, this isn't in Alec Forbes, I got this from the biography, mm-hmm. that the first doctrine that he was taught is, 
I believe in the eternal damnation of hell. And so rather than starting with the love of God, it starts with the wrath of God. And yeah. if you don't please God, and of course, even if you did try to please God, if you're not elect, you're going to go to hell anyway. Yeah. And it was such a depressing approach to faith. Yeah. No, no wonder people were giving up on Christianity mm -hmm. to um, other Scottish uh, writers who had a, a more Calvinist background. Thomas Carlyle gave up on his faith. John Ruskin gave up on his faith. Yeah. Uh, Ruskin's autobiography actually starts, his very first page of his autobiography is about how he was forced to memorize chapters of the Bible. And so Christianity just became this oppressive legalism oh, yeah. that abandoning it was such a relief. And yeah. I think this goes back to C.S. Lewis was the exact opposite when he read MacDonald. He had been an atheist. He had already decided he was an atheist. And what died was his atheism. Mm. He realized the simplicity of his atheism. Yeah, I agree. With, I wanted to go back to the severity of the Calvinist creed. Uh, the very first question in the catechism, the question is, what is the chief end of man? Chief and end the of answer man. is the chief end of man is to glorify God and, enjoy and to him. enjoy him forever. And then George MacDonald wrote, for my part, I wish the spiritual engineers who constructed it had, after laying the greatest foundation stone for truth could afford them, glorified God by going no further. He wished they just stopped after that first question. He thought they yes. got off track after Yikes. that. Right. Wow. He has these great lines in Alec Forbes of Haugland. And what I like about this novel is it doesn't get preachy. Some novels uh, written by Christians can have long passages that mm -hmm. explain doctrine, but he'll just throw things in. And one of his lines is about how these um, strict Scotch um, Calvinists, quote, chew the bitter cud of ill-cooked theology. Isn't that a great mm. line? And um, how a minister has a vague, half-monstrous embodiment of truth. Mm. And even election he describes as a biblical egg hatched in their own likeness. Ooh. Well, I, th I think Lewis draws out a really important point. I would say one of the things I enjoy the most about uh, McDonald is his theology. Mm. Um, and That's the door you enter. And the, the positive side of it. So uh, McDonald focuses a lot on God as a giver. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I think a really good sermon to read from his unspoken sermons is the word of Jesus on prayer. McDonald, uh, Lewis has like 30 or 40 quotes from it in his anthology that he pulls um, but he really makes a very strong case for, you know, which is interesting because in McDonald, he went through this, I mean, his life was struck with poverty, um, mm -hmm. a lot of challenges, disease, disease. Sickness. Yeah. yeah, a lot of sickness. Um, and yet he saw God in such a positive, loving light. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you see in the word of Jesus on prayer, he talks at length about, well, you know, why do we have all these needs? And McDonald's point is, we have these needs because what we really need is God and God mm -hmm. wants to give us th good things. And in those good things, God is trying to give us something of himself. Yeah. And so McDonald was able to see how through nature, God is actually giving something of himself through us. And if we can see God and the spirit in those things that God gives us, then we can enjoy communion with him. And then also through spiritual things. And so he's seeing all of these things the lack of something becomes a positive because it's a way for God to draw him back into relationship mm -hmm. with himself. And so McDonald is able to give a positive spin on things. I think when you read him, whether it's his novels or his sermons, and it oftentimes is opposed to that hell perspective, mm -hmm. he finds a way to, f to spin things in, a, in such a positive way that it develops a sense of gratitude and wonder mm. and awe and praise in you. Well, he actually does that with hell. The whole idea that God's a consuming fire, it's not punishment per se. It's like hell is this great smelting furnace and we're trying to burn away all the impurities and the things that make us unhappy and keep us uh, far away from God as our own selfishness and our own vices. So he even turns hell into kind of a positive 
purgatorial fire to yeah. bring people to burn away yeah, sin. Yeah, burn away all the impurities. George MacDonald becomes a major character in the great divorce. And he says, well, if someone is separated from God in their prison of themselves, that door is locked on the inside. God yes. didn't lock them into that place of punishment. Yeah. One of the most famous lines I think he actually gives to MacDonald when he says, in the end, there are two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, thy will be done. Yeah. And oh, he's it's just very so beautiful. clearly influenced by MacDonald there. There's right? this wonderful character in Alec Forbes. And, ah, uh, I am so sad that people are not more familiar with MacDonald after reading this novel. It's just a fantastic novel. But anyway, there's a character named um, Couples. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. C-U-P-P-L-E-S. But he... Um, is Coup- a mentor. Couplets. <laughs> <laughs> Couplet. Couplet. Mr. Couplet. He lives in Scotland. Um, <clears throat> he, he was a mentor to Alec Forbes when Alec Forbes went off to uh, university and really was charmed by Alec Forbes and came to vi- visit Alec in his hometown and was excoriated. Because on a Sunday, he picked flowers. Uh And I think from Michael Phillips' biography that actually McDonald saw that happening. You couldn't even pick flowers Uh on a Sunday. One of the charges against him when he uh, took the church in Arundel, uh, one of the charges was he was seen picking flowers on on Sunday. You'd think they would remember when Jesus healed on a Sunday. (laughs) Or when you're the dis- sounding very fair, or when the there. disciples pulled grain off of the grain as they're walking and right, then rolled it right. in their fingers and ate it, and Jesus defends them. They're like, what, "Have you not read?" Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. Let me just finish about this couples or couple, um, <laughs> however you pronounce it. Um, <clears throat> so he's excoriated for picking flowers on a Sunday, but then he was responsible for taking Alec Forbes out to pubs and Alec develops a drinking problem and couples so loves this young man that he gives up alcohol in order to help um, Alec Forbes give up alcohol. So he sacrifices his own pleasure in order to help someone else. And I think McDonald is giving that as the example. This is what, Jesus did. Yeah. Jesus Mm -hmm. sacrificed his life. This is an example. Love is sacrificial Mm -hmm. rather than love um, expecting you to go through all the paces to make um, sure that you have satisfied a judgmental God. Yeah. Yeah. But notice how, though, with McDonald's, you can phrase that in a positive way. It's something that he's giving up. It's a choice, right. yes. As opposed a to a loss, something that's taken right. away yes. from you, yes. you know, or or he's gaining the sanctification of this young man and his delivery right. from alcohol by giving up his enjoyment of alcohol, and so he's actually gaining something by giving, and so it's right. not just a loss, you right? Know? And it's after he made that sacrifice, he wasn't a Christian before this, that he started becoming interested in what is mm. God. Yeah. He, he, he Alec being, Forbes, was not a Christian. No, excuse me couples oh okay oh, okay. oh yeah. okay we're all having trouble with our antecedents this yeah time. <laughs> well yeah. lewis you know it's funny <laughs> lewis actually makes a joke in uh the preface to mcdonald's anthology about he goes through and he capitalizes all of the pronouns for for god as he because he's like you know they're so hard to keep track of pronouns in english what you know we use in any advantage we can um so that, it's funny that you mentioned that because apparently that's a problem in McDonald. <laughs> uh, uh, I want to mention another mythic moment in one of the Curdy stories where there's this uh, beautiful old grandmother figure who's kind of an interesting female embodiment of the benevolent God that mm-hmm. reigns in the attic. And uh, when Curdy, the minor son, goes up, at first he can't see her at all. It's very similar to the last battle. He just sees this dirty old attic. But once mm-hmm. his spiritual eyes are opened, he sees this beautiful angelic woman. And she says, see that fireplace? I need to have you put your hands into the fireplace. And it's shaped like a bouquet of roses, but it's all on fire. And it's called the rose fire. Yeah. And so he obeys her. And just as any fire would do, 
he puts his hands in the fire and it's extremely painful. It's agonizing. And he eventually pulls them out and looks over. He has tears in his eyes. It's so painful. But he looks over at the grandmother figure and she has tears in her eyes. And she says, well, I too have put my hands in the rose fire. Mm -hmm. And then this deformed creature comes out and uh, he says, touch the, this creature. It almost looks like some kind of a, I don't even know how to describe it, just a, I said deformed creature already, didn't I? <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. It looks but, like a deformed creature. <laughs> but when he touches it, he feels this beautiful, fragile little girl and he's feeling the spirit behind the appearance. Oh. And so through the suffering of the rose fire, he's actually able to perceive the spiritual nature of someone as opposed to their external like, appearance. Mm. And it's one of those mythic moments of if you suffer, if you've put your hands in the rose fire, it may give you a great deal of spiritual perception and empathy that you might not have had before then. Wow. Mm. Mm. One of the things I also like about McDonald is that some people accused him of being too liberal and others accused him of being too conservative. <laughs> mm. And that tells you yeah. that he was walking this tightrope between falling down into one side or the other. This is something we need to be thinking about in our own times with such polarized rhetoric mm. where people absolutize human interpretations rather than seeking to walk with their Savior. Yeah, mm. yeah, definitely. So my question to you guys is, uh, if somebody's coming into McDonald, maybe they've never stepped into the McDonald house before, mm. which, which novels or works would you recommend that they start with? Because thankfully, most of them are all in the public domain. Um, and so you can go out and get mm. decent copies or at least electronic copies of almost all his works. So David, Crystal, where would you guys recommend that people start? Well, you can tell where I would like to start, <laughs> Alec Forbes of Haugland, but find one of these editions that translates the Scottish, oh, okay. or it just is too laborious yeah. to get through. Okay. I remember this even was a problem when I taught Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, because there's a servant at Wuthering Heights who has this Yorkshire brogue, and it's just so hard to understand, yeah. and the students would just want to abandon the text yeah and follow that with robert falconer okay alec forbes and robert falconer david i remember that problem of dialect with robert burns he says uh, uh the best laid plans of mice and men oft gong aglay and you go is that a good thing is that a bad thing <laughs> <laughs> it means off go astray oh i would start with the children's stories mm. um i mentioned the rose fire I just read a fascinating one called The, the uh, Day Boy and the Night Girl. And this witch raises a boy only in the daytime. So he knows the sun and colors and warmth and the birds singing. But he, he knows nothing of nighttime. Mm. And the little girl knows only the night. The witch wakes her up only at night. So she knows the moon and the coolness and all the night sounds. And they finally meet and start introducing each other. Well, here's oh. what day is like. And here's what night mm. is like. And once again, it's both very and, mythic. once again, yeah, it is it's both not and. either or. And you could say allegorically, we all have this domain where we think we know what life is about and we think we have enough experience, but suddenly somebody introduces us to a whole new realm that we didn't know was there. So I would tend to start with the Curdy stories, uh, The Light Princess, um, Day Boy and Night Girl. At the back of the North Wind is a very profound meditation for children on uh, the problem of evil. Mm. This figure who he thinks is an angel of God ends up sinking a ship and he has to deal with why would an angel of God sink a ship? Mm. So I think, and that also doesn't have any problems with dialect. The writing is simpler since mm -hmm. he was thinking of children. I really liked The Light Princess, partly because MacDonald is playing with language there. And in addition to my specialization in Victorian literature, I also specialize in critical theory and discourse and how language shapes our imaginations. And he, MacDonald, does this fun thing where this princess is so light, she keeps floating up in the air. But he puns on the idea of light. She has no gravity because she's laughing all the time. Uh -huh. So he's playing with the word gravity. She can't stay grounded because yeah. she doesn't have gravitas. Yeah. And it has a level of interest to children 
But then the more you know, the more you can appreciate it as an adult, which Mm -hmm. is one of the things I like about the Narnia Chronicles. Mm. You can enjoy it as a child, but when I first read Chaucer and read about the Parliament of uh, Fowls, I said, oh, that's what C.S. Lewis is doing in the Narnia Chronicle with the Parliament of Owls. He's alluding to Chaucer. (laughs) So the more you know, the more you get out of it. But that takes brilliance to be able to write something that appeals to both a 10-year-old and an 80-year-old. This is something Chesterton marked out. He cited The Princess and the Goblin as a book that had, quote, made a difference to my whole existence in that it showed how near both the best and the worst things are to us from the first and making all the ordinary staircases and doors and windows into magical things. And MacDonald said, I write not for children, but for the childlike, whether they be of five or 50 or 75. Mm. And I think that is an influence on C.S. Lewis as well. Yeah, right. And I wanted to mention, Lewis said, part of the reason he loved McDonald's, he said he knew of no other author who so continuously aligned with the spirit of Christ. He felt like so often he was hearing elaborations and amplifications on Christ's teaching. Mm. Uh, when McDonald briefly uh, preached in Manchester, uh, one of the parishioners said, when I first saw him take the pulpit, here's this big burly man with a long beard, and I just didn't know what to expect. But as soon as he started speaking, I felt like I was listening to the voice of Jesus. Wow. Mm. And you know what a wonderful tribute to someone. Uh, his son, uh, uh, Ronald McDonald, oddly named, uh, <laughs> not his fault, but uh, his son Ronald said, as much as I admire my father's books, I admire the way he conducted his life even more. Mm. Wow. And once wow. again, a great tribute to someone whose life and writings are really consonant. Yeah, it's a testament to his literature and his writing that, yeah, whatever it seems like whatever you come to his novels with, struggling with, reading them sort of exposes that and teaches you something. Mm. Mm. As opposed to a novel where it's very obvious the moral that they're trying to teach. Mm -hmm. There are, I mean, in The Light Princess, there's clearly a moral he has in mind, but there's something about reading his stories that illuminates different parts of your life that you didn't anticipate. Mm -hmm. It's almost like going to a psychiatrist or having the spirit reveal something to you that you didn't know was there. And so, yeah, it's one of the things I appreciate about his novels, at least. Mm -hmm. Mm. Chris, you started with the metaphor of the the house with many rooms. Uh, MacDonald had this very evocative image. He said that uh, God has many chambers, and he has one chamber specifically for you. And your goal in life is to get to know God so much that you understand exactly which part of that, which part of him is meant for you. So he almost uses Mm. the image of the many-chambered mansion as a way of looking at God and a way of finding your particular niche to find your true name the white stone of your true name and revelation Mm. in your relationship with God. Mm. Wow. That's a good place to end. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, guys. Thank you. The Wade Center Podcast is a production of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Our hosts are the co-directors of the Wade Center, Drs. Crystal and David C. Downing. Our episodes are produced and edited by Aaron M. Hill. If you enjoy the podcast and the content we offer, please leave us a review on iTunes, tell your friends, and consider making a donation to The Wade. The Wade Center is entirely self-funded. Financial gifts help support the expert services, fast collections, and varied programming we offer at no cost. If you have questions about the podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at wade at wheaton.edu or contact us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. To learn more about The Wade Center, our seven British Christian authors, what we offer, and how to make a donation, visit our website at wheaton.edu slash wade.